Welcome to Digital Church. This is hour three of our New Year's Eve prophecy revelation or prophecy observation. Really, basically, what people call a prophecy update of that with which we know is going to happen in the near future. And when we say near future, we mean that Jesus is coming sooner than you think. He's right around the corner. He's knocking at your door. As a matter of fact, you could probably hear him call out to you if you just listen some more. So really, what we're talking about is between the years 2017 and 2034, the rapture and just about everything that's been predicted in the scriptures, in Matthew 24, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, and most of what you know that you call prophecy will occur during that time period. It doesn't mean that it starts in 2017, but it doesn't mean that it precludes it starting in 2017. As a matter of fact, we're one of the few that for over 40 years have been saying, no, you will not be raptured this year. And we do believe in the rapture. Want to know? Well, here's my book. <laughs> I'll show this to you in a minute. I don't think you can zero in on it, but... Uh, this, is a pretty, this hour, we're supposed to be talking about the probability factors of why we say 2017 through 2034. Now, I want to give you kind of a shortcut way of saving a lot of time, is that during January, the majority of what we know and what we teach and what we preach and what we've been sharing and caring and daring to tell people about with Jesus coming again, we are posting on the internet through Facebook. Obviously, we have blog accounts. Obviously, we have video church. Obviously, we have videos, which are videos that we post on the internet. There's about 10,000 videos out there that we've done, which was mainly about your relationship with Jesus and how to hear his voice, how to know and how to understand and how to comprehend what it is that the Spirit of God that is doing by the Word of God in you, the people of God, to cause you to know Jesus in a personal and intimate way. We have an expression for it, but we also have a lot of things that we do at Video Church that are not like other churches. We will be in the coming year, if the Lord tarry, and we will be saying that a lot more, you'll hear the words anathema, maranatha, meaning that, hey, if you're cursed, you're cursed. That's it. Buddy, it's over, man. I mean, you had your chance. All up until 2017, man, you could have done anything you wanted to. Now you're being confirmed of what you're doing. We'll tell you that are blessed. Maranatha, he's coming. He's soon. You may not make it in the rapture, eh, you know, but you're going to make it through the tribulation. Hey, cool. Or you're going to die in the tribulation with the help of the Lord. God bless you. You will have a blessing and not a curse. We will talk about those things as though they were going to happen because those are the things that are happening. The letters to the seven churches are about seven different types of Christians, seven different types of people, seven different churches that exist anywhere, anytime, any place when you read them. They can even be seven stages that you're going through. They are even seven different eras of church age that we have gone through. They are the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be. Even as the book of Revelation gave us that key to understand what is happening and who God is. You see, the key to Revelation is that which was and is and ever shall be, or that which is, was, and shall come. Meaning that it's the conjugation or the observation of the word I am, or to be. We often say that the God that we serve is the God called I am, which is not true. God did not say, hey, I, this is my name. No, he said, I don't have a name. And yet, we have taken what he said and made a name out of it for him called I Am. We have taken the yud the the you know, which is the words that are a statement of the expression of what God was saying to Moses when he said, I am that I am, what I am, I am, and what I will be, I will be. To my people I shall be what I shall be. In other words, he was going to reveal himself at times to his people in different ways, in different shapes, different forms. In the nature of the Holy Spirit, we see God revealing himself in a different way. 
In the nature of his son, we see God revealing himself in a different way. In the nature of the father, we see him revealing himself in a different way. When God wants to bring judgment, he reveals himself in another way. When God wants to bring love, he brings him, reveals himself in another way. We see God described in a variety of ways. He is, as people say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If that to you is an offensive statement and you'd like to say Trinity, he's Trinity. If you say Triunity, he's Triunity. But God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are one. Now, I know as a Gentile, you can't get that, you know, because you're going to argue about it, you know, and there are a lot of Gentile wackos out there that are out in left field. Well, okay, they're not even in the field. They're up in the bleachers screaming down about what they believe in. Because they don't even come to first base. I mean, they don't understand what they're saying. They want to believe in God only, which is some kind of uh, deity that they say that the Son is not one with the Father, and the Father has already said that they are. They're arguing with God, not with man. Or they try to deify the Torah and make it into some kind of mystical, magical, you know, carpet ride to get them to wherever they're going. I don't know, but you better hide because it's going to be very hot down there. Let us just say that the fact is Israel, Jewish people, scribes, know exactly what Jesus was saying when he said, I and my father are what? Or when he spoke to the guards, to the temple guards, and said, I am, boom, they fall down. How the heck did they fall down if Jesus just said, it's me, or I am? He said something that caused them to just back up, stumble backwards, that shocked them to their core. He stated the yud heh He spoke not like some Pentecostal preacher going, I declare, and this is yud heh and we're going to use the word of power for the word of faith, or the word of wisdom to be the word of uh, you, you know, knock them down. So we've now got the spirit of knock them down with the word of knock them up, you know, with the spirit of fill them up and all that kind of weirdo and wacko and bizarro and someplace out there, not where you want to be. So, really, with everything that's happened, how can you know that you know that you know the truth? I had a man recently that, you know, he, uh, he lives in Southern California, you know, I mean, he's going to, if he watches this, he knows I'm going to be talking about him, <laughs> because he already figured it out, you know, because the Lord does that sometimes. But he has a lot of questions, and he's asked me questions over the years, because he's been concerned about his faith, about where he's coming from, and where he's going. And I don't blame him. I would be concerned, too. California once was influenced heavily by varieties of ministries that all exploded during the Jesus movement. We had Melody Land. We had... PTL Club. We had Trinity Broadcasting Network. We had CBN. We had Full Gospel Business Association. We had Campus Crusade for Christ. We had most, uh, not Multnomah, but um, I think there's three different uh, Bible college universities that are there and seminaries, one or two, in Southern California. In other words, this was a field that was ripe to be exploding in the Jesus movement when God poured out his spirit upon it. Because prior to that, oh, there had been a few that were saved, you know, a few people here and there, you know, that had been right on through the years, you know, and don't get me wrong, Ellen, ba Ellen Baker Eddy, Ellen Baker Eddy or Eddy, whatever her name is, as a Pentecostal whatever starter, you know, she may have been off. But she may have had some good. And so there may be things that she did that was right, that inspired people to go with the moving of the Holy Spirit at the turn of the century. What happens a lot of times is this. People get, and I'll give you an example that you can understand. Let's call this Red Bull, okay? I could probably, you know, take a sip of Red Bull and I'd be fine. The more Red Bull that I take, the more that I start to talk like this, the more that I start to act like this, because once I start to take Red Bull, I start to get more caffeine, the more caffeine that I get, the faster I can talk, the faster I can talk, the more that I'm going to burn up energy, the more that I burn up energy, the more that I'm going to be hyper, hyper, and now I'm going to be all over the place, because I'm going to be so excited that I won't be able to contain myself. But is that the reality of what God said? Did he say, run, or be still? Did he say, jump, 
or did he say stand? Did he say wait or did he say go, go, go? Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta get, gotta get, gotta get, gotta make, gotta make, gotta make. Good question. Because you see, there's a reality of where you're coming from that determines where you're going. I'm Jewish. Well, you know, I'm not going to tell you every Jew goes into the Great Tribulation period, but huh, called time of Jacob's trouble for a reason. And I can't promise every Jew or any Jew that we're going in the rapture. I don't know. That's one of the few things I'll tell you flat out that uh, <laughs> I have some strong probabilities about. You know, and maybe I'll tell them, maybe I won't. But, you know, such a deal. We've been prepared for suffering for so long, we know how to suffer, sort of. You know, and don't like it, but we do it anyways. But in the last hour, we talked about the shadow of things to be. Reality of what Jews are is not a shadow only, but they are also a reality of what is true. Suffering does come to you, period. You can be a preacher, teacher, gospel, you know, eater of God's taking it all upon himself, and because Jesus suffered, I don't have to, and I'm going to be blessed out of my mind, and gorgeous, and fancy, and free, and making money off the tree, you know, and I'm going to have everything I ever wanted, you know, go everywhere I ever thought I would. So you die, you know, you've had your reward, guess what, you ain't getting any more. So, yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, I can say something like, uh, you know, our favorite grinner, you know, that, I don't want to talk about hell, because... Frankly, it's a depressing subject. Well, you know, I mean, hey, I don't blame him. Hell is a depressing subject. So, if he winds up making it to heaven, I'm not going to fault God for it. I'm just going to say, I'm pretty sure he won't have anything in heaven where you might. You know, and you can figure out which preacher that I'm talking about or which teacher. Down in Texas with a lot of money and it's kind of, you know, hair, curly hair. And I forget his name right now, but I ain't going to go there because <laughs> I don't want to be left out or left behind. But as a Jew, I go, hey, you know, you got to tell the truth, even if it's us. And so I don't lie about where Israel's at today, apostate. I don't lie about where the church is going, you know, downhill. I don't lie about where I'm at, you know, struggling to make ends meet. Well, okay, we're covered as far as making ends meet. But spiritually, whoa, I look at it and go, uh-oh, trouble. I mean, that's really where I'm at when it comes to end times. When it comes to eschatology, when it comes to latter days, when it comes to, do I think I'm getting raptured? Uh-oh, I don't know, but I don't think so, but maybe so, who knows so? God does, so I know that if he wants me so, then I'll go so. But if not, then I'm going to be around telling you, uh, don't lose your cookies, but I'm here too, and you know what? We can follow through and not lose it and be blessed anyway, because God will save the day. You may die, but then again... He was telling you, you could die anyway, right now, every day, so that way you should be prepared to meet the Lord every day, not just a certain day that you think is the day you're going to be spared from dying. Really, teaching of the rapture in the modern evangelical church is the teaching of the fear of death. They are terrified of people dying and not being able to have an assurance of an abundant life and enjoying life as God intended you to enjoy it while knowing this isn't your home. I look around and I say, thank God the Grand Canyon isn't my example of beauty. That looks like some gaping wound torn into some kind of planet Earth, you know, and it looks like, wow, man, you know, that's beautiful. You know, it's bleeding all over the world, you know, and I'm like, you know, that's kind of maybe what creation feels like. Because it wasn't quite that way in the beginning. It's torn out of the Earth, ripped open. Think about that. Not everything that we see is how God sees it. God didn't create the Grand Canyon and everybody goes, wow, look at the beauty of creation. Anybody hear the curse? <laughs> you know that uh, kind of like, you know, earth stumbling to and fro like a drunken man? Staggering under the you know, onslaught of man? I mean, hello? What God created for us was called a garden, and I don't see any garden there in the Grand Canyon. You know, I mean, somehow, I don't picture horticulture going on dramatically in, you know, water going, whoosh, whoosh, splish, splash, and the dam holding it back. You know, I mean, a lot of what we got 
is really not what will be or shall be. You know, Chuck Smith had a favorite teaching that I love, or maybe it's my favorite teaching that he taught, and I just love it. But it was about, and it may have been Missler, one of the two, but they probably both taught on it, about the rose bush. And it may even come from trees in the desert. But that every thorn, we're told by horticulturists, is an undeveloped bloom. So if God said to the thorn, rose bush, thorns and thistles, you would bear. No longer will you be there that you're just a full bush that's meant to be aromatic to the entire world. That you would be thousands of petals and thousands of aromas coming out from your growth as a beautiful sacrifice of incense unto me that's natural and so beautiful to behold that I would place you in my garden and keep you there so that it would be just an aroma on the air. No, he says, cursed are you because of what man has done. Yeah. So the rose bush you look at isn't the same one I see. I see what could be. You see what is. I'm saying that's a cursed one and it's nice but that's not the reality of what we're going to see it's the price we pay for the sin that we did one day back way in the garden. So when you consider things like Emmanuel Velikovsky's book, World in Collision, you might get a closer idea of the world being in catastrophic throes of not evolution, but devolution. I don't believe in evolution. I believe in devolution. Devolving. In other words, the evolutionary idea is that somehow you're growing upward into something that you're evolving into, and I'm going to tell you, hell no, you're devolving into something you were never intended to be. Hell and fit for hell. Animals, mankind, the world, creation, everything is wearing out, not getting better. It ain't. Huh. My God, there was a time where in this country, an insult was a shooting event. You said something about someone else, and you would have a duel on your hand. Legal. Andrew Jackson shot a man over his wife that he was having an affair. And he was. But he still had a duel for his honor. There were times where we spoke of honor and integrity and pride, and it meant something. Founding fathers, a lot of people like to say they were something that they're not. They like to say that they were somehow you know, Christians. They weren't. They were utopianists, but they had a different way of looking at the world and understanding providence or pride or etiquette or court manners or mannerism and manners. You didn't just walk up and be able to say someone, F you, you know, use the F bomb, you would have been dead. Not only would the guy have killed you, but the community would have put you to death. And I mean America. The Puritans were putting people to death on the stake for witchcraft over all kinds of slights. If you read some of our history about love affairs, I mean, my gosh, when they talk about putting the H on a person or the red mark, hey, that would sustain a sin because people were Puritanists. They were working very hard on being very close to God. Unfortunately, that's what happens with legalism. The closer you think you are, the farther you are by killing off others. That's what happens with Puritanism. So, it's not about this idea of God that we have. It's not about the good hey, bob hey. It's not about, you know, having a rescue through the rapture. But rather, it's having a relationship as we are to not only the world as it is, but the world that is to come. So when I say that I don't want to look at the world and have someone tell me the Grand Canyon is beautiful or that somehow Denali is a great mountain or Everest or whatever, and I see it as as not quite the same way you do. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate a certain amount of beauty, but compared to what heaven is, it's garbage. It's slime. Do you realize it is? Because it's time that you began to hate the world and the things of the world and anything that's in the world. Because you're not of the world. It didn't mean the things of the world meaning like, oh, well, the evil or the bad or the, you know, whatever you want to make esoteric. It meant that the environmentalist is dead wrong. 100%. We're not the repairers of the world, as the Orthodox like to call themselves. And now Christians are picking that up to present in a new kind of heresy, kingdom now. If we present the kingdom now, we can bring God down to earth. We can bring Jesus back. All we got to do is go out there and save the world from itself. You know, 
carbon dating or carbon making or carbon taxes or anything. Carbon, you know, let's get rid of the fuel, the taxes, you know, and the ages. Because, you know, carbon dating, we say, is, you know, making the world older than what it really is, and it's not that old. Or that carbon taxes is supposedly paying people to not pollute, but in reality, it can be swapped so that they can pollute. And then we have carbon... <laughs> I forgot the last one, but we'll go there. But, you know, in any shape or form that you take something that's as dark and black as carbon, you're not going to come out of it without soot on you. Stain of that darkness or that sin or that reality that's not true. You see, there is no darkness in life. In Jesus, there is no darkness at all. In God, there is only light. So anything that you know or anything that you believe in or anything that you think, if it's in God, it would automatically be lit up. It's not going to bring you down. It's going to lift you up. So the devolution of mankind has been the evolving of these false ideas that somehow we're better than we are and we're going to be treated to a better destiny than what we deserve. So we make grace worse than what it really is, and it's meant to be a place where we recognize our depravity, our sinfulness, our egos, our ugliness, and everything that's created in the world is not of us, but that we can turn to God and ask Him to help us. That's what the spirit of prophecy meant by knowing God and knowing Him who sent Him. In other words, knowing Jesus and knowing God our Father. Because once you see God, once you know God, once you've experienced God, you know how ugly and sinful and disgusting you really are. I got news for you, Pentecostal. I got news for you, uh, coaches, Christian coaches. Well, let's just tell them that they're beautiful. God loves you because you're beautiful. No, you're not. You're ugly. You're an sinful. You're a dead carcass walking. You're a zombie. You're not anything like what God will make you into being. Because once you are set free, the Son whom has set you free will set you free indeed because you'll be free from the ugliness that you have, your body. Now you could be a Cheryl Keith to Raquel Welch or whoever you want to put up there as a pedestal of the perfect woman, and I got news for you. That's ugly. What do you know Eve looked like? She was beautiful without having to bear any clothes or any makeup, and yet nobody stared because she was naked, because she was purely from the innocence and the reality of knowing God and being intimate with God and shining forth her spirit, her soul, and her body. Created for Adam. Not anymore, so don't go there if you're going to try to make some woman into substitution of man. Sorry, I'm not going there. I know that men are corrupt and so are women, so if you try to make marriage into that kind of routine, I'm going to say, uh-uh, baby, I ain't going there. Marriage is a three-part uh, covenant agreement. It's God, man, and woman. That's what marriage is. Because it's supposed to be a type of the church. If the church is without God, we got a problem, honey. Because if it's just, you know, people in a church and in the pastor too, then you only got two and that ain't three and I got news for you. Somebody's leading someone to church. Put the Holy Spirit back in me. But still, it's God and the church and the people. Three parts. That's why it's the bride and the bridegroom, and they aren't without the Father. Do you see? Kind of get the picture here? There's someone that's always going to be there. And it's not man and woman alone. In those things that have been presented to us, that's why the probabilities of anything happening before 2017 were irrational. They were illogical. They didn't make sense. They were, in fact, in some ways, for some of us who have known for a long time when the Lord was going to return, within reason, they were stupid. I mean, I don't know if you can remember all the things that have gone on since I got saved. 88 reasons the Lord's returning in 1988. That was pretty dumb, wasn't it? I never even saw the book. You know, that's something that I found fascinating. I wasn't even in Southern California at the time. I wasn't around for it. I don't know what the hysteria was. I don't know what the craziness was. And I wouldn't have fallen for it in the first place. God took me out of there. And I was probably in Alaska at the time. You know, because I'd been to Alaska two or three, well, that might have been my first time. But I'd been out of the area. So I might have been up in Oregon or someplace. But wherever I was, I never even heard of 88 Reasons. I mean, I had heard of books like God is a UFO and Jesus is, you know, an alien and all these other wacko books that used to be out in the 60s and 70s, but 88 Reasons, never heard of it. 
But that was the beginning of a realization that even though we as Jesus people were telling people that Jesus is coming, did we understand that it was in our generation, we would be the last generation, but we would be the first ones declaring Jesus is coming in a real way as opposed to a Jehovah Witness way, which, you know, we know from the 1700s, 1800s on, they've been predicting wrongly when he's going to come. Sadly, that's what we were trying to talk about when we mentioned about do you get wound up, wired up, and, you know, inspired by Red Bull. Because for some Pentecostals, rolling around on the floor and barking like dogs, it's not they're wrong. They have that feeling. But the feeling isn't that with which God has done. It's what they have done by overreacting, overacting the emotion they're feeling. Do they feel that emotion? Yeah. Do they laugh uncontrollably? Probably. Are they giggling and googling and barking and, you know, playing? Yeah. Because they've been inspired to by watching something on television. Really. Most of what happened in the movement of the gift of tongues, because tongues is true, the gift of tongues that is, and the manifestation of varieties of ways of that gift of tongues being manifested, meaning like sometimes it's a foreign language, sometimes it's angelic, sometimes it's just simple, you know, gibberish, sometimes it's talk, sometimes a variety of things, but that's the Holy Spirit. But the point of it being is that it's not what people are doing since the Jesus movement. They are looking at, seeing, and imitating what they have heard. I mean, God knows I can put on CBN right now and hear something that's being repeated over again, and I can tell you by the way of interpretation, that's not what it is, but it's what they're saying, and it's self-declaring of stupidity. Seriously. But it's being repetitiously said over and over again, and the Holy Spirit is making them no offense to the end. There are some people that are just out there that are there for the money, not for the gift of the Spirit, or the gifts of the Spirit that the Spirit of God can cause you to know. Are you going to be speaking in tongues in heaven? No. Not at all. You don't need to. Why would you? You don't need it at all. It was given for this earth, not for heaven. It's not the angelic or angel language. That's false. That's not true. It's not something that's going to go on. You will know as you are known, and you are known as you will know, because that's actually what goes on in heaven. It's not Hebrew being spoken. It's not any language being spoken. We're told of that, which is that which is communicative, is in the physical realm by our vocal tongues. I can tell you, can you understand an animal? Animals speak. They talk. They communicate. And yet, you don't understand them. Understanding an animal would be the gift of tongues. Can an animal speak? You better know that they can, because if a jackass could tell Mr. Prophet, who was becoming a false prophet eventually, but Mr. Prophet, that, uh, hey, you got to watch out. There's an angel here ready to part your hair, you know, and you're going to get a haircut, or you're going to die, because he's going to kill you. And Balaam didn't seem too surprised that the donkey spoke. Matter of fact, I know most people listening to me speaking don't think don't, half of you aren't surprised, the other half don't believe it. You think it's a lie. It's not. The stupidity is when people take cats and dress them up, take dogs and dress them up, and think that somehow God isn't going to hold you accountable for making idols out of these animals. Domestication was not something that was created by God giving you authority over animals so that you could have a deity complex and play God on cats, dogs, rats, hamsters. Really? You think that somehow dressing them up and taking pictures and putting them on Facebook is going to make you more what? Acceptable to God when you're treating animals like humans? That's taking God and his creation and lowering it to the level of your satisfaction. And entertainment. It's evil. It's disgusting. It's worse than what the Egyptians did. And they honored their animals by making them into gods, not dressing them up and making them into humans. You know what you're doing. You see, that's part of what and why we knew that the signs of the times had not fully occurred. Back in the 60s, it looked like, you know, the world did it our people. Yeah, well, Israel became a nation. Yeah, you know, we could. After all, isn't that when the 
onslaught or the fulfillment or the promise of the tree bearing fruit, the fig tree, you know, will not pass, you know, and that the, the tree would not, you know, yield its fruit until all these things be fulfilled, that, you know, would not pass away until everything is accomplished. Or is it? Which season? Is it about a season? Is it about a year? Is it about a tangle? Is it about a time period? What is it about? We talked about in the last hour with Israel that Israel as a nation began in the 1800s, not in 1948. Actually, in some ways, Jews don't even treat 1948 as the beginning. The atheist Jews do. The Orthodox Jews that are in Meishirim don't see Israel as a nation right now. Seriously. They do not honor the government of Israel. They do not treat the land of Israel as being a nation yet. Messiah has not come, so the Orthodox and Meishirim teach that it is an abomination that is in the land. I don't have a problem with that. I look at it and I go, you know, they got a point. And they're Jewish. They're very much Torah observant. They are following the Torah. They are absolutely not any graven images. I mean, they are so ultra-Orthodox, they make the Orthodox look pagan. Seriously. <laughs> it's an unbelievable, incredible experience to go into Meishering, if you can, without getting yourself killed. But a whole different world, and you don't even know that it exists there. And these are Jews in Israel living in the land. They do not accept the government of Israel, period. Israel goes in there and at times has to do things, and they get stones thrown at them because the ultra-Orthodox don't use guns, knives, or anything else like that. They do throw stones. They expect God to condemn them. I mean... Not the ultra-Orthodox, but to condemn those that they are opposed to. These are Jews. These are religious Jews. These are Orthodox Jews. These are some of the people that you've never seen before because they don't, they're not the black ass wearing curly cubes running around saying, hey, you know what? Come on, you know, send me your money. No, not quite. Sorry, it isn't that way. But these are the ones that you won't hear Benjamin Netanyahu talk about at all. He doesn't like to show the dirty laundry. And yet every Jew feels protective of them. Why? Why do we feel like we got to protect them when they are so opposed to us? Interesting, isn't it? That God would do that in the heart of a Jew. So, in seeing those things and knowing those things and realizing the things that were about to come to pass, we could look at things like any reasons that, you know, the world was coming to an end was wrong, not only because of what was said in it, but because we had prepared ourselves. Hal Lindsey was famous for starting the realization, and he's going to, and someday God will look at him and say, hey, you know, that was a problem. That was John the Baptist in the books. I mean, not John the Baptist really, not the spirit of John the Baptist, but he was one who started a whole generation looking at Jesus coming. This generation. He wasn't the only one, but he was the main one. There were others that had an inkling, there were others that suspected, there were others that were pretty sure. But no one put it into simple man's terms except for Hal Lindsey. He sat down, he was not a Bible scholar, he is now. When you do this long enough, believe me, you become a Bible scholar. He sat down, he wrote The Late Great Planet Earth, and it's still true today. You can tell me there are parts in it that are wrong, and I'll tell you, prove it, and I'll prove to you you're wrong. Easily without even breaking a sweat or even breaking a Bible. I mean, come on, it's pretty simple. Late Great Planet Earth, go read it. How is it? You might understand it. It might seem archaic to you or it might seem super simple. That'll give you a primer. Nowadays, people read things like the LaHaye's and the... I uh, can't think of the other guy's name, but... Um, Larkin or not Larkin, but something like that. But the LaHaye's La or the books on... Uh, the Last Day series, or the Rapture series, or Left Behind, there we go, Left Behind series. It'll give you kind of a fancified, you know, fictional idea of what's going on. A lot of it you kind of get, eh, you know, is it true, is it not true? Eh, you know, looks good, sounds good, but is it exact? No, but it is a pretty good depiction of it. Same thing with um, watching Thief in the Night, like we used to watch, some of the old corny ones. You know, it's kind of like, we got a lot of our theology out of that. So there's a lot of things out there that sounded good, that looked good, but as we examine them, 
and we lived through them, they weren't necessarily accurate. There were times where people thought that, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of one of the phony ones. But anyway, as far as false prophets, false teachers and those things, 88 was the first of the major ones that really deceived people and they fell over it. Um, in the 1990s, there was something that came up, I can't remember, early 90s, you know, that wasn't as big. Then we had some of the Koresh things going on. We had some of the Manson things that have been over with, but then some other events happened in, in the world, you know, in America that was kind of bizarro that was going on. You know, there were hijackings, but in those days, you know, we didn't call the jets being hijacked as being terrorists, you know, even though they were. We didn't, we didn't think they would fly them into the towers. They just took them and landed them somewhere. They weren't stupid enough to kill themselves. Yet they were Muslims, weren't they? See, you got a problem with your modern day theology when you start saying all Muslims are a certain way. They're not. <laughs> you got to go back in history, not very far, your history pre-9-11. Then you start looking on and on, and you see that we created the terrorists from 9-11 because what we did to I can't even think of his name. The Saudi prince, son of a Saudi prince that decided to, you know, take it to America. He studied here. He had the experience of living in America. He knew what he was doing. And he rejected the idea that we could turn our backs on his people and on different nations by paying them to fight and then turning our back on them and letting them die off like we did. We have. And we continue to do if you think that somehow, you know, the army is doing a wonderful job in Afghanistan, go meet some of the Afghani people. They want everybody out. Get out! We've had it. Go. They don't want us. You go back to Iraq and Iran, I mean, come on, let, let's go see where Iran came from. We did it. Go back to Iraq, see where some of the ISIS comes from. We did it. We created the vacuum and we let this happen. And then we said, well, you know, we, we paid for and we had this dictator, then we decided that he was too cruel, so we decided to take him out, so we took him out, so many. And we decided, you know, well, we're not going to um, show our true colors, but we're going to try to play by the rules. And so now someone else comes along and says, hey, we don't play by rules. We'll take your weapons, we'll take your bank, we'll take your guns, we'll take your money. The money for ISIS came from America. I mean, it wasn't they took it from somewhere else. That's why they're still going. They had a lot of money to deal with, a lot of money that they could invest around the world and use, and they did. They were the least of terrorism. They were one of the fiercest, but they were the least. But they got a whole lot of help from, guess who? USA. And it wasn't about the president. It wasn't about Bush or Obama. It was about the failure of man to recognize the time. Going into the Middle East trying to make peace is always something. Why are they going back there to do it again? Think about that. Why does every president want to do that? Because he thinks he's the one. They look at prophecy in a different light than you do or I do. Now, I look at prophecy as Jesus is coming. You may look at prophecy as the end of the world. Someone else may look at prophecy as the rapture. Someone else may look at prophecy as, hey, we got to go through some suffering. You know, and until that happens, I'm not worried about it. And there are a lot of Christians that way in America. The plan of God doesn't change. The purpose of God has never been removed. But where you fit in that purpose can be a difference of opinion because you aren't in where you think you are. Now, I wrote a book, you know, like I said, I was going to talk about a little bit. Uh, I wrote a book series called Fact. And it just, you know, says fact. You know, and then it shows a picture of a scroll and it says rapture here. And, you know, there's some things underneath this, and then um, ask some simple, basic questions, and I promote, I post the answers. Will there be a rapture? Does the Bible state a rapture? Does everyone go in a rapture? How many people go in a rapture? How few is few? Who gets to go in the rapture? Can someone know when the rapture is? Is there a catastrophe at the rapture? What is the sign of intending rapture? Will there be a great revival after the rapture? Should people predict the rapture, what should I do? See it? You know? This is over 20 years old. Nothing in it has changed. I didn't write it prior to 20 years ago, but I was teaching it prior to 20 years ago. 
So it's over 30 years old, the same thing I've been teaching. You see, one of the things that's a fact that doesn't change is what God says. All those things that I put in here, I'll post on the internet again, and it'll be on Biblical Prophecy Today, and it'll be on Facebook, Michael James Stone, and it'll be on Twitter, or somewhat popping by and going by, you know. And, you know, the blog is Mike is Biblical Prophecy Today, and you'll see it, you know, Bible Prophecy Today, and you'll see it. But if you go to Facebook and just look for me, you'll find it. Or if you go to Vidibo Church or Vidibo, you'll find Vidibo Prophecy out there on the internet, on YouTube. But the point I'm trying to make by it is, we don't change. I've never changed my position on the rapture or end times or eschatology because I said something then and I say it now. Until the Mayan heresy goes by, Jesus is not coming back. People are going to believe in something that will not happen until everything that they predicted has failed. Then they'll say peace and safety. So as long as there were people that were prophesying, right now it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And so I was easily able to tell people every year for the last 40 years, no, Jesus is not coming this year. No, it's not happening in 20, 2000, which was the big one. And I remember being in, I was in Jerusalem at the year 2000, at the turn of the century, when um, supposedly, you know, computers were all going to die. I mean, we already knew a few months before the year 2000 that they weren't going to die. I mean, Israel already had a cure, you know, I mean, had the solution for the clocks. You know. Interesting that their clocks are messing up the years. Limited knowledge to think that that was the only thing that was going to happen. Because then they were still saying the infrastructure. Have you noticed that we're still talking about the infrastructure is going to crash and burn because you know, somebody's going to hack it? Well, back in the year 2000, which is over 13 years ago, we were talking about the whole infrastructure falling apart because the cameras were going to. The, cameras, the calendars were going to be wrong. The clock was going to fail. 13 years ago. Still talking about it going kaboom. Now we're talking about electromagnetic pulse happening in the air, some big thing setting off, and then, you know, you have to, it'll burn out your computer, you know, and then you'll be left hopeless and helpless. No water, no lights, no gas, no electricity. Gloom and doom. Do you remember the uh, Red Bull? There's a lot of bull being thrown around nowadays. And it's not just by people who are wound up on Red Bull. Thirteen years ago, the infrastructure didn't fail. Now, Russian hacking, the infrastructure didn't fail. The Russian hack happened. Not as weird or wacko as people want to believe it was, but they did hack. They did get in, they got information. They stole information. And they kind of dribbled it out, kind of like a WikiLeaks, you know, they kind of Said, said it in certain ways and promoted it and posted it in other ways to influence people by disinformation, by manipulating facts. We have done the same thing to them. We have done that to other countries. We are doing that all the time. Everyone's doing it. It just so happens Russia got caught, so it's made a big deal out of it. So, did Russia change the results of the election? No. Did they influence? Yes. Now, who caused the elections to go in a certain way was simply the American people. We're not the brightest of the bunch. We are a people that would just as soon listen to Cardassian tell us the truth as we would listen to Donald Trump tell us the truth and ignore Jesus. Literally. Because most of America, growing up now, is used to watching television for their backs. Listening to the National Enquirer of TMZ or CNN or Fox, well, even worse, Fox News, who is just an entertainment channel. They are not full of journalists, and the journalists that are there aren't doing a full journalism job description. They are doing a partial one. So, though they want to be and change, and they're trying to morph themselves into a news service, they're not. They haven't been there yet. They're not getting there yet. CNN started off as a news service, tried to follow Fox when it got popular, and then went back to being just a news service. They can't do it. Unfortunately, entertainment in the Fox News circle of friends and people is simply about one-sided perspective, bias, and prejudice. And I'm not going to say it's always wrong, but I'm going to say it's wrong a lot. And unfortunately, they don't care. The same way that Donald Trump can shoot off his mouth and not care what the results are. How can he do that? Because he has no ethical or moral compass. 
it is a sign of the latter days, a sign of the times. We are told that, you know, and you're, you're going to hear this a lot about, you know, I, I've been trying to avoid everything that's common. In other words, everything that you should already know about prophecy, I haven't talked about. Because, you see, I'm adding to what's already been laid down as a foundation for everyone. You know, children that are disobeying their parents, uh, people, you know, um, arguing with authorities, you know, people being rebellious, you know, the violence increasing. I mean, all of these things have been around for a long time, since the 50s and 60s, people talking about the end of the world. And they're listed in Hal Lindsey's books, they're listed by every prophecy scholar you can imagine, until they get to their part where they're off the wall. John Hagee, one popular pastor, very much so wrong about red moons, false prophet, because he teaches about red moons as being four moons and tetragrammas and things. Now, he's not wrong about his his uh, graphs that he was using until he changed to start putting red moons on top of them. But he was right about the end times and using charts and talking about you know, Israel and those things. He was pretty accurate for a while. Then he got caught up with the, the uh, Jonathan Kahn one. He got caught up with worshiping Israel and wanting to make Israel like somehow, well, you know, God's not going to do this, but he'll do this. You know, adjusting prophecy to fit his perspective of what the kingdom is and how the kingdom will be accomplished. Changing the fact of the great tribulation into something that's not so bad. Sometimes you feel that way when you got grandkids. You look down and you think, would God send them to hell? Hell yes! If you think babies are innocent, you don't know God. You don't know creation and you don't know sin. You better repent. Because in reality, everyone that is born of a woman is in sin. Period. There is no innocency. There's no age of accountability. It's a lie. It's been a lie. Matter of fact, other Protestants even know that. I mean, John MacArthur was one of the first ones to say, Hey, this age of innocency is a lie. Age or age of accountability. It's a lie. There is no such a thing. I mean, I like the man for that. I don't like the man for some of the things else he's done, but you know, everyone has something what we call a part. We see in part, we know in part, we speak in part. That's what Paul said. But when he has come, then we'll, the fulfillment will be there. And that's why we can take parts of different places. We can take some of uh Hagee's false teaching, throw out the garbage, bring in the good. We can take some of, well, forget Khan. Khan went into such a weird lie about a lot of Jewish things to try to make America fit prophecy that he conned you. He knows. I mean, the thing I hate about a Jew that's conning America, like Netanyahu and Khan, is that they know. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's why it's evil. It's not just false prophet or false teacher. It is evil incarnate. They are aware of what they're doing and they know what the truth is and they are teaching something else anyway. Getting away with it while they can. Judas knew what he was doing. He wasn't deceived by his own sinfulness. He knew what he was doing. Evil. And Satan possessed them for it. So, at some point in time, if you're going on the abstract, you're going to be possessed by Satan. He's going to confirm to you your evilness. Before that happens, you're going to find yourself in a place that 2017 is, where God is going to confirm your choice. You are going to be making a choice of going two different directions that are going to go completely opposite. And they happen to be up and down. One is going up, the other is going down. The fact of the matter is, is that one degree of separation changes that decision making between what is holy and what is profane. You have that opportunity to not be deceived or self-deceptive by not following after those things. If it's violent, if it's social causes, if it's anything that's distracting you from God, then it's evil. It's wrong. It's satanic. It's not meant to bring you closer to God. Shutting down an abortion clinic does not bring you closer to God. You don't score points or get kudos for saving babies. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. Following Jesus and doing what he tells you to do, which is to what? Go out and make disciples of all nations. Making disciples doesn't mean going out and creating them into your own image to accomplish, you know, some new kingdom you're going to set up that somehow we're going to usher in, you know, the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's not what he said. He said, go out and tell them my words. Sermon on the Mount. That's simple. Love. Forgive. Have mercy. Give grace. Receive grace. 
The substance of what God said is the essence of what God is, is what you have to become. You will never be that way if you're continually fighting, fraught, arguing, debating, and being in some ways caught up into the world. If your job is taking over more time of your personal life than God is, you're going to hell. I'm going to be straight up with you. Your job was never there to give you your personality, to give you power, to give you identity, to give you satisfaction, to give you ego, to give you self-esteem. Your job was there just to give you an opportunity to use what's available, money, to go out and do the ministry. That's it. You're supposed to be minister first, job second. You say, well, i got to provide for my family. No, you don't. God said, I will provide, not you will provide. God may have given you a job that you prayed first and asked for. Not that it just suddenly fell on your lap and all. Oh, now this is the one I picked, so God is with me. Ah, you see how often people say something like, oh, well, God told me to be a football player, and are they still a football player? Maybe God told them to be a minister, and God used the football player. You see, there's the difference. God's going to use you where you are to minister to where you are with the people that are about you. and there, as God is choosing to use it for his purpose, you ask him, what do you want me to do here, wherever you are? And that's where prophecy is today. It is going to happen to you, no matter what. It can happen with you if you are a part of it. It can happen in you if you are knowing what prophecy is about, which is the revelation of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy is the revelation of God's only begotten Son. From Genesis to Revelation, it's about knowing Jesus. Do you know Jesus? The fact of what the problem is today in the modern society that we live in is that we are promoting, preaching, teaching, and exemplifying a false Jesus. When in the hell did Jesus ever say to anyone, go and join the Roman army so that you can kill in the name of God? Now, I know the Catholic Church has said that, and they have done that quite a few times. Not just in position, but in the Crusades. I know that Jews have done that in the Maccabean Revolt, which was totally evil. Brought in a false priesthood and a false kingdom. to have moaning kings. My God, it was so good when Jesus finally ended that line. Holy cow, what a corrupt, evil generations we had with the Herodians. King Herod. Man, they were not peaceful people. They were people that were totally evil, manifested as in the kingdom of God, as being the king of Israel. I don't think so. I'm sorry. This doesn't work that way. They were the manipulators that came out of Judah Maccabee. Yeah. You know, the one that you're going to say Hanukkah was so wonderful. I don't think so. I think it happened and it occurred, but that doesn't mean that it was righteous and holy. You see, even the disciples got caught up in the wonder of Jerusalem. They've been out in the bush, you know, out in Israel, in uh, the Galileo. So when they come to the temple, they look at it and go, wow. And I'm sure they were looking up at the tall stones and the big pillars, you know, thinking, God is there. And Jesus was saying, you see the temple? And they're going, yeah. And he says, not one stone will be left over. Say, what? Reminds me of that little black kid you see on Facebook. Say, what? Who? What you talking about? I mean, really, Jesus demolished all idols that were lifted up as being examples of God because God was the example standing in front of them himself. Prophecy is about himself, not just events going on in the world. You will never understand prophecy until you have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus because he is the source of all prophecy and he is the fulfillment of all prophecy. He will allow you to understand things according to where he wants you to be. If he wants you right beside him, then you're doing what he wants you to do, which is to preach, to teach, to evangelize, to witness, to tell people about what you are and tell people that you're a Christian, to go to Bible studies and start Bible studies and be a Bible study, to be a living witness of a page of history that's reliving itself out in the world today that is a living epistle of what God is doing in the world, about the world, and to the world through the spirit of prophecy, but it's the living word of God that is being made manifest 
to the believers in God that they are actually performing the same thing that has already been written in the book. The disciples should not be Peter, James, and John, but should, should, should be David, Luke, and Harry walking along the streets, doing the same thing that the disciples did, and greater. Not just some guy, you know, standing on a megaphone, megaphone going, ah, yeah, yeah, you know, and yelling and screaming. No. But like the Jesus movement, whatever you know, you share and show. Whatever you got is what you give away. Whatever you have is what you need today in order to be that witness. Jesus said, you would be my witnesses. But are you? Are you really? And I have to answer, no, I'm not. I am a voice, in a way, crying in the wilderness, but I'm not in a wilderness. I'm in America. That's not a wilderness. Not really. I mean, I can pretend like it is, but it's not. I am living in a very comfortable land. I am living in a blessed land. I am living in tanned houses. I am living as a rich man. Ain't nobody that's rich going to call me rich, but I'm living as a rich man. Because, frankly, when you have all of these things that America has been given, we know we are rich and we have no need of anything. We lack nothing. And I don't care whether you're an addict on the street, you're homeless, helpless, and heartless, and you're broken and beaten and disgusted. You were still rich. You chose that. You didn't have to be there. You went there. And in order to get there, you had to start with riches. So when we talk about probability factors, what we're talking about is those issues of every single scripture that's written in the Bible that we can fulfill and see that God has accomplished in us, with us, and to us in the world. And then we say, how does it fit? And I'll give you an example. i got to get up for a minute to get it. But I'll give you an example of that. In the last hour, we talked about that. This is my uh, Salem Kerbin reference Bible. For other people that really, you know, they pick on certain Bibles, you know, like NIV, NEV, also, King James Version. Who cares? doesn't matter. I like King James because it reminds me of royalty. It reminds me of etiquette. I have an articulate type of vocabulary that responds very well to the King James, and it also causes me to understand some of the Hebrew into the English because Hebrew is written in such a way that it's about expressions. A word will be written that covers a sentence or covers a paragraph, meaning that there's more to the one word that's written, and it means an expression of things. A conceptualization, in one word, of that with which is written there. Mikhail is my name, Michael, in Hebrew. It's a statement and a sentence and a question. It's complete in and of itself. Mikhail means who is like unto God. If I said, hey, who's like Jesus? I would say Mikhail. One word. Yeah, really, Mikhail. I don't know. That's your name? Yeah, that's my name. Same thing with what happened to God. God said, I am that I am, and I ever shall be. What I shall be, I shall be, and that's what I am. You know, I mean, they came up with, do they love it? I am. Not quite exactly, same, but close enough. So, that's why I like the King James in a way, because it reminds me of the conceptualization of everything. Because they changed some of the words to Lord, you know, kind of made it fit. Because it does fit better that way than it does if you just simply say, do they love it? So, these things that you see here, are my tabs, not from a, you know, like a daily Bible study, you know, because it, you know, there's one page, the next page, and the next page. Gosh, I can't even tell what, what book it is. Let's see. Zechariah. And let's see, the next page, and the next page, and the next page, and the next page, and the next page. And if you can see all these yellows, those aren't, you know, like um, the um, prophecies of Messiah. This volume of all these tabs, which are hundreds, I mean, buku butts of them. It's something I did for my sister when I wrote the book, um, Thousand Years, Genesis, about the millennium. Uh, 
I was writing a book series about what it would be like to live in the millennium. It's nothing like what you guys think, because I know I've never read anybody that wrote one like it. Ellen Gunderson Trainer wrote a lot of books that are similar to that. Um, she wrote like John, Son of Thunder and some other fiction books that Ellen Gunderson Trainer. If you read her books, you might get a better handle on some of the things that will expand your mind as far as understanding scripture. But as far as this is concerned, these were the volume of the scriptures about prophecy and about prophetic things that were being stated, not only about the millennium, but about the nature of God and the nature of what it was going to be like in the millennium. And so that in and of itself just demonstrates how much there is, if you wanted to make an outline, of scripture about the last days, the end times, where we're living today. And so when people... I understand people watching this wanted to say, you know, well, I thought it was going to be about, you know, an outline so I could follow it. You have an outline. All the Bible pastors out there have always given an outline. Jesus gave you an overview in Matthew 24. You have an outline in uh, Revelation that you can follow. You have things that are being said in the Eagle Church that you can follow. You have a, a literal outline that I'll be posting for you in the Clarence Larkin charts that you can look at the chart and see what's going to happen, what's going to happen, and when's going to happen. But if you're going to think that I was going to convince you somehow of believing, no, I'm not. If you don't know, you don't go. That's it. Bottom line. If you know, then you go. If you don't know, you don't go. So that's how you're going to determine, do you go in the rapture? If you know, you go. If you don't know, you don't go. See, that's pretty weird, but it works. Because... I practice something that's called integral specificity, which is an idea and a concept of the revelation of God revealing himself through the word of God, by the word of God, in the word of God, as the word of God, the way the word of God is, by the spirit of God doing it for me. Systematic in theology simply says, hey, we got to study something about it and figure out which ones were right, which ones were wrong, if this is true, if this isn't true, what this applies to, how we can make it you know, um, applicable to our living, applicable to our life, and all these other things. Not me, man. What God says is, and what is, it was, and what was, it is, and it's going to ever tell me. So I just take it as it is. It is what it is, where it is, the way it is. Integral specificity. I practice that as not systematic theology. I don't believe in systematic theology because I believe that it's external and not internal. I believe that it's the external examination of theology and doctrines and covenants without it being the revelation of God revealing doctrines and covenants. I believe one is from man looking and the other is from God revealing. Integral specificity. That's what I do. That's what I believe in. That's how I look at all scripture. The whole idea of expositional teaching is just simply, man, you know, you really don't get expositional teaching. What you get is preaching. Expositional teaching is a guy studying on his own, getting his notes together, and then preaching to you what he's learned. That's expositional teaching. They might add personal application and a little, you know, uh, hermeneutic, and homiletic, and then you know, a couple other things, but that's expositional teaching. He's just exposing or expository or expounding upon the Bible. Doesn't mean he's right, it's just commentary being spoken. That's it. Don't get wrapped up in the words, expository teaching, or expositional teaching. Not wonderful, just something they do. There's no difference in, um, pardon me, expositional teaching does not have to be Genesis to Revelation. Some people think it's that. It's not. It's just expounding. Any topical study is an expositional teaching. It is. See, that's the problem with systematic theology. You don't get the understanding unless you get into theology in order to understand what the word is they're using in order to try to differentiate between what they're saying and what they're doing. And it doesn't fit. It's just man playing ego with Greco logic and coming up with fallacy. Sorry, true. I can't deal with systematic theology. It's so wrong that people think it's right. And that's why Chuck Smith even warned, man, if you go to if you go to Bible college or you go to seminary, there are more seminaries that have turned out atheists than anything else in the world. And he was right. And even now, Bible college is being perverted in Calvary Chapel. I have heard one man tell me what his Bible college was that they had taught, you know, when they were going to it. He said, Well, you know, it's kinda of like this. We take the Bible, you know, and we take it in story form. We tell stories, you know, a little more in depth for whatever level of understanding that people are at, but we, we just tell the story over and over again and that, you know, each successive 
you know, higher time we go through it, we get a little more deeper and deeper. We just keep telling the story. Rabbis do that. And then they add their own stories. I got news for you. A lot of expeditional teaching, sometimes I've heard some of the pastors teach it, and there are Calvary chapels that have added their own stories to it. Seriously. Their way of looking at it. Nothing wrong with that except for A, are they correct? And B, did God tell them to? I've got news for you. Integral specificity doesn't allow me to do that. I can't make anything up. It is what it is the way it is where it is. You can read it and I can read it. We come up with the same thing. If God says, this is sin, I'm going to tell you, this is what the Bible says, this is what God says, and this is what you can take to the bank, and it will always be the same. This is sin. That's not an allegory. That's not a metaphor. That's not a simile. That is what is here, right now, right here, in this place, as you're listening. This is sin. How confusing is that? Jesus said that you're yes, be yes, and you're no, be no. That's why prophecy is so blown out of proportion. People have taken and changed it. It was meant to be a revelation of blessing to you. It was meant to be that you can know the times and the seasons. It was meant to be that you should know Jesus is coming. You should obviously be aware that he's coming so soon that you don't have time to raise your children. You don't have time to invest in your 401k. You don't have time to take your house out on another loan and remodel it. Jesus warned every one of those people in the parable of the rich man who said, Hey, you know, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I've done everything I ever wanted to do. You know, now that I've got barns full of food, what should I do? He said, I know what I'll do. I'll build a bigger barn. I'll get a mega church. I'll build a bigger church. I'll get bigger pews, bigger housing. I'll expand my, my, my network farther out. I'll have remote churches. I'll have a church over here and a church over there and I'll just stand up in front of them and I'll be able to preach to everyone. And Jesus says, you fool! Tonight, your soul will be required of you. Yeah, I'm talking to the mega churches. But I'm talking to a baby church. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. Because whatever it is, if you haven't this day, today, heard his voice, you are going to hell. In other words, God doesn't say, hey, you know what? Get saved. Once you're saved, always saved. No problem. You did it. You got it. You're gone. You go over with. Now you've got to get to go go forward so you don't have to do anything else. You are in the, in the black. You are in the green. You are in the money, honey. If you get to go to heaven because you did it back 20 years ago and your family is like, oh, so saved. Uh-uh. That is not what God said. That is not how salvation works. Salvation is today, every day that you're awake. Today is the day of salvation. Not, I did it 40 years ago and I will save them, so now I'm saved. No, wake up and you're saved. You can be. If you aren't, you know why. Because you turned your back and you went the other way. It is a daily thing. Not a once a year, once a 10 years, once a crusade. Every August, you know, we're going to meet down in Southern California and have another party. And rededicate, 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 rededicate. No. You see, Jesus took the nations and separated them like sheep and goats. He's going to take people and separate them like sheep and goats. What are you becoming? You see, every day you change a little bit. You're either becoming more or less like God. I believe that everyone's becoming less. I believe that we can't survive the times that we live in. That except these days be shortened, we would not even survive the spiritual trials we're in now much less what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation when Jesus said that even those things had to be shortened even more so because they would not survive. That's the Son of God saying that. Warning them. So, are we supposed to be like Gaga, Google, or hey man, I'm just chilling. Jesus is coming, yeah, yeah. Jesus is coming, I'm safe, safe. Jesus is coming, I got it made, oh yeah. Or is it Oh, God, save now. Save us. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. In the temple in Jerusalem, they were saying, oh, we got God in our box. We're back here behind the door. And Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Behold, your king cometh. And the people are crying out, save us. Save us. Save us. That's what Hosanna means. Hoshana. 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 Save us now. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. Save us now. And they throw down their talis, and their talis katanas. They throw down their robes. They throw down their blankets. They throw down their possessions. And they say, walk on it. 
but save us. Take us. We are the doormats. We are willing to be your servants. Save us now, King. Save us now. Save us from Rome. Save us from prostitution. Save us from constitution. Save us from Israel. Save us from America. Save us from these things. Save us so that we can make you a king so that we can have our own kingdoms. And Jesus walked away. You missed the point. It's not about just save us now. Save him. Take me. Save Donald Trump. Leave me behind. Rapture him. God knows. Please do. We'd be better off. But save him. That's what we should be. Moses interceded for the children of Israel, not himself. Abraham didn't say, hey, bless me. He said, oh, God, spare Lot. Not by name, but he said, you know, one or two, you know, and save him. Where are we at? What are we doing? Have we become children of God? That's what rapture is about. You're not going to go. You're not going to go. I'm going to just tell you, you're not going. Because the, the country's been telling you you're going no matter what. I mean, everybody's been saying, no matter what, hey, you know what, you got sent, you're going. And Jesus said, two would be taken, two would be in the field, one would be taken to the left. It's an expression. It doesn't mean that there's two people walking in the field and one's going to go, poof, and their clothes fall apart. Stupid. We'll talk about that next hour. Or that, you know, the shoes are left behind. There are so many faults. There's a rapture coming. There's a not solved. Hebrew, we say not solved. It means to snatch away, to rescue violently, to steal out of the clutches of death itself, and to rescue for salvation, or to preserve, or to take away. In Hebrew, we say, you know, violently snatched away. Now, somewhere along the way, we got poop smacked into the air. Because it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall not all die, but we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and then we shall be caught and caught up into the air. Then they say we'll be caught up in the air and changed in the twinkling of an eye. Read it carefully. You're going to find there may be something there more than you realize or you are aware of so that we can talk about it. You may want to reread those scriptures carefully. Not in some weird version, but in the original. You know, kind of, I'm not going to make you go read Hebrew or Greek, but I'm just going to say even King James is a little more closer, but even yours might be pretty close. So you read it wherever you want to, but Get this idea that it doesn't say, we're going to be caught up in the air and changed in the air. It says we're going to be changed in twinkling of an eye, and we'll be caught up in the air. There's a difference of two actions here. Yeah. You may want to be aware of that. Or it doesn't say we're going to be caught up in the air and changed in twinkling of an eye. Think about that. Think about time sequential orders. Because where it is, the way it is, as it is written, is what it is. It isn't something that somebody says normally in a way that would be easy to say, hey, guess what? We're all going to disappear in the twinkling of an eye. Does it say that? You may want to read that again. So, when we are aware of all the real scriptures out there, like I showed you in that book, all the volumes of them, we got to be looking at the scriptures themselves to see what they say, not what people say they say. We have to take them literal as they are, because literally Jesus rode into the temple exactly to the day that the decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem, and until that decree expired, Messiah was supposed to come, and if it didn't come up until that generation that was passing away, then there would be no Messiah. That's why Isaiah had to be fulfilled at that moment when he rode into Jerusalem, because if he didn't, guess what? Zechariah and all the prophets would be wrong. There would be no Moshiach. There would be no first coming of Jesus. We would not have a church. We would all be wrong. But why Jesus rose into Jerusalem was on the exact day that he did, it was prophesied. Behold, thy king cometh. He is lowly and riding on a foal. Of an ass. All of a sudden, that opens doors of all kinds of problems, all kinds of timing. That's why we want to say to you, Jesus rode in on that day, but that is the day he died, and it's the day that he was risen from the dead, the day that he rose from the dead. Those apply, but it was at the beginning of the week he rode in. 
by the end of the week, he was gone. Dare I say to you, the rapture at the beginning of the week, you should be watching. By the end of the week, you'll be gone. You have seven days you can know the Lord's return. Seriously. Seven days. You can know for a fact. Now, I admit it took me uh, uh, four years to know what year. No, it took four years to know what feast and what timing. It took me uh, ten years to know what year with the reason. Now, my years are still coming up, that I believe, um, very confidently. I used to teach that it was between 2015 through 2022. Then I added 2034 because, you know, it's true, between 2015 and 2034, all of it could be fulfilled. And that, you know, any time of the during that time could be fulfilled, that's all I knew that could happen. So those are pretty accurate dates. But the extension wasn't changing any of the 2015, no, not 20, 2017 to 2034. Sorry, 2015 was something else. You know, somebody prophesied. That was wrong. But 2017 to 2034. And I've been teaching that for a long, long, long time. And people just, you know, so I just simply told them, no, Jesus isn't coming to you. And I tell prophets that all the time when they're predicting, including Hagee. Hagee was wrong last year. He said on the four moons, Jesus is coming. Rapture will happen. Then he had to backtrack. And he didn't backtrack. He just ignored it. He's got books out that still state when Jesus is coming last year. Or we haven't quite entered into, let's see, the new year. No, nope, not yet. So this year, in about 12 hours, he's wrong. Well, maybe less than that. But soon, he's way off base because he missed it again. And he said it before. Jonathan Kahn is so far off base that nothing has he said that's been true, and yet everybody keeps buying his books. You see, there's a key there. Buying the books, saying it to get you to pay attention, provoking your thoughts, giving you what you want to hear. I didn't give you an outline that you could follow. I didn't sit down and say, hey, you know what? By the time you get done with watching these videos, all four hours of our hourly thing, then you'll know when Jesus is coming. I didn't say that. I simply said, this is what we're going to tell you about. And we have. Hour one, we told you about, I can't remember the name of it, but the shadow of things to come. You know, and hour two about Israel as being a shadow of the things to come. Uh, hour one about America, where's it in prophecy? It's not and it is. It's a macrocosm or a microcosm of the macrocosmic world. In other words, it's a, it's a picture of what's happening in the world. So if you see something in America, you'll see it overseas. Literally. You know, you see a terrorist attack in 9-11, you'll have seen it overseas somewhere in the same way it format, you know, getting ready for the end of the world, preparing yourself. You see rebellion against people, you see it in greater degree in the world. We are a world, in a way, of a, a mirror or a crystal ball, you could say, or a timepiece of those end times, just like Israel is. But since Israel is also fulfillment in and of itself, then you have to look at Israel in a different way because it's a timepiece, yes. But the children of Israel that we talk about as far as we living through them are written in the book. Are they not written? Are they not given to us for instruction, for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness? Are we not living our same lives as they are? I mean, God knows anything but he looks at King Saul, they can look at King Donald Trump and know that it looks pretty close to the same thing. You know, I mean, pretty good, you know. Or, you know, if you want to look closer to, you know, in New Testament time, right? you don't want to look that close. It's going to remind you of somebody in the New Testament, and you ain't going to like it. Because we got four years to deal with it. If the Lord tarries, and if he lives so long. God bless him. I hope he gets saved, and I hope he goes to heaven. And his family. God knows I doubt it. I just know that he's a rich man. And how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? I have to declare it, because he's rich. God said it. I have to live it. you got to know it. So guess what? If you're rich, God worries for you. You won't enter the kingdom of heaven. There are a lot of people out there, you know, I mean, even this man that was talking to me, he's telling me about somebody that bought a house, he's a minister, and he's a preacher. I never watched him, I watched, I started to watch him once, I said, no, nah, not my cup of tea, you know, they want to listen more, because then I have to condemn him if I find out what is wrong. But if I don't know what's wrong, I don't pay attention to it. Your cup of tea, not mine. There are a lot of people out there that are good teachers, for whatever they're teaching, but, you know, sometimes people ask me questions, well, are they about this, are they? Can't recommend it, man. I mean, you know, you're just going to go down the wrong road. And I don't know about this guy that he was asking about, but 
he was trying to tell me about all of his housing and his deals and how he got this and got that, but could have got it this way, got that that way. And but you know, if you got to explain it, it's wrong. I don't have to explain anything about my life. It's an open book. Have I been married before? Yes. Have I had other wives? Yes. Did I fail them? Yes. Did they fail me? Yes. Were they all saved? Well, you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of them, I think. Yeah, you know, my Jewish wife that decided to abandon me because she wanted to be more orthodox, you know. I'm not so sure she's saved, you know. Yeah, you know. Ah, you know, she's a tough one. Now, anyone else I could say, saved. Previous? Nah, you don't know. You know, I mean, you know, there's a real scripture there that says, hey, anyone that turns back, man, you know, God will have no pleasure in them. And that's Jew or Gentile. And the reason for supposedly doing what was supposed to be done, you know, I don't think that would have ended so well. Can't say, don't know, aren't there right now. But guess what? You know, I can say that, mm -mm, don't look good. And so, you know, if a person like Donald Trump starts off the way he is, and if he's out of his office the same way, he's going to hell. You can't say things like that. You really can't. You get away with it. You'll go to hell. So, why we didn't come out specifically in order of all these probabilities because we're going to post them. You'll see all the studies and all the different prophecies that have been out there. Why we say, you know, we took a part of that one and that has like maybe 20%, you know, this one has maybe 90%, this one has 80%, this one has 70 And so we come up with, their, they were off on this part, so we add this to this, and put this, and this, and this, and this, and you get the probability studies that we have that we're presenting. Why? It's through 2017 to 2034. Uh, Don Koenig did studies like that. Um, there's a guy up in Washington that's a, uh, kind of went off on a tangent, but he did studies too. He's um, now into um, legalism. He, he, he thinks he, he's, he's uh, replaced with theology, kind of, sort of. He's got a weird kind of idea about the end times now. Um, his time frames were wrong. His ideas about when Jesus was born or when he was conceived, and that stuff, not wrong. I mean, those are really good studies. You know, it was really well done. Um, his time frames about the end of the world were good. You know, so I have no problem with knowing that he's off now. So I don't recommend you know, finding him or knowing who he is. But you know, such as it is. Don Koenig, I think, has gone off on a couple of things. I'm not sure. I don't remember. Um, Jim, uh, there's a guy that says Grace. Uh, not the gospel pretty great, but something about grace studies. Um, he has uh, you know, asked the pastor something. I can't even think of his name right now, but um, he was right on. I mean, he's right on about his ideas, about everything theologically. Unfortunately, he stepped out, you know, a couple of years ago and said that the Lord was coming that year, and then he denied that it was, he said that. He said, well, I, maybe, you know, kind of like the Chuck Smith thing. Chuck was accused of saying that he came, you know, he's coming in. 80s, you know, at the end of the 80s. I don't know. I wasn't around to hear it. I still can't find it, so I don't know if that's true or not. But the point being is that um, I can't think of the name, but everybody listens to him now. He's pretty right on. He's pretty mellow, pretty wonderful. You know, good teaching, good answer questions. Right? He wrote a lot of books, you know. Um, I wish I could think of his name to drop on my head, but I can't. But anyways, he's one of the ones that, yes, he formulated a lot of the probability studies from also. He also believed in what his mind were. Even though he was wrong, he had the format, but he just a couple of things. We knew what he was wrong on, and I told him that. I even wrote to him and said, look, you're wrong about this. He said, no, I didn't say that it was going to be that. I just said that it was going to be maybe. You know, I said, well, okay, he's dead now. Now they're carrying on for him, but you know, he's, uh, he's dead. He died. And he's gone. He's with the Lord. He was so right on. I mean, I would have, you know. I, I still post his studies sometimes, or his uh, Bible studies, you know, in our Bible studies page, you know, and I uh, highly recommend them. Because they'll lead you closer to the Lord. But wrapping this up this hour, those are the materials from 40 years of study that I got news for you. You can't get to where I'm at today. You can't. You're not Jewish, most of you, you know, that are watching. The ones that are Jewish, they wouldn't be reading what I read. I mean, they don't want to. You know, it'd be boring to them. Uh, a lot of what I read was boring. I mean, a lot of things are dry reading. But you come to a place where God is sending you when you decide to sacrifice other things in your life 
in order to be prepared for such a time as this. God used my life to get me ready to be a part of this last stage, Armageddon generation. Eschatologically correct, biblically accurate, knowing full well that there are the majority of people out there that are going to completely disagree. And even then, the ones that do agree will still think they're right about, you know, hey, I'm going rapture. And the day after they're left behind, they're going to crucify me if I'm here. But as yet, I can tell them, look, the rapture was never about you being correct or walking according to the right way or the wrong way or being a sheep and not a goat. The rapture was about God gets to choose. God decides. In the letter to the seven churches, he says, look, if you're in this church, this is what you got to do. You don't do it, you don't go. So if you're doing what I told you to, you're going. If you didn't, you're not. You know or you don't. And if you don't know the letters to the seven churches, you aren't going. You are not going in the rapture. You are not going in the rapture. Now, there are people out there that I, you know, I had guys already write me, and you know, they're all over the place. And, you know, starting January 1st, we're not answering anybody. I mean, we'll answer some questions, but we're not answering anybody to like, prove it. Pardon the expression, but I got, you know, way of Christianity is going to shock you. Screw you. I don't have to prove anything. God doesn't prove he exists. Go somewhere, you know. Go ahead. Be that one degree off, you know, which you're more than one degree off if you're trying to say to me, prove it. You're way out of line, and you're going farther down the tube that you're going to be flushed. Because God isn't going to put up this much. He doesn't allow us to always be stomped on, romped on, chomped on, and made a fool of. Sooner or later, you're going to find Noah standing in the bow of the boat, well above the waves, saying, and he doesn't go, ha ha, ho ho, he, he. No, he says, oh my God, why me? And if you have that attitude of, well, Lord, not my will, but I will be done. You might go. You might go in the rapture. But if your reason to go in the rapture is you want to, you're not going. If you start a list of people you want to have God save, regardless of where they're at, and you pray and you're passionate about it and you want it more than you want to be taken yourself, you'll probably be spared the great tribulation. And you're not going to hear that in a moment. They're going to tell you to do what God wants you to, and you get blessed through it. Right? I uh, talked to a woman the other day. Wonderful Christian. Christ-like. Uh, can't be provoked. God knows I provoke everyone. Didn't provoke her. Something I wrote, she just simply said, you know what? I really don't care if I go to the I want you to go and go to not, and he's going to give me the ability that I need during the time of the Great Tribulation. I went, that woman's going to the rapture. <laughs> She'll be perfect for the Great Tribulation, but that's the time where God pours out his wrath upon the earth. Well, God doesn't pour his wrath out on the church. Then what are the seven letters of seven churches where it says he pours out his wrath? Blessed are you if you endure to the end. Don't tell me God doesn't pour out his wrath upon the church. That's a lie. He doesn't pour out his wrath on the church. He pours it out on the world. Some of the church is in the world. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time, but you might be doing the right thing if you're turning your life over to God. So there's a lie that's out there that wants to spare you. Oh, don't make the people suffer. Tell them that there's an age of accountability. Tell them their babies are going to heaven. They're going to grow up and see them again. Tell them all the aborted kids, you know, that are dead and gone are going to be grown up, full-born in heaven. You know, they're like the angels. They're, they got their wings. You know, now they're grown up and flying around. They'll meet you on the way through the pearly gates. Boy, are you deceived. If you believe somebody telling you that kind of crap, do you really think that's what God is all about? That's a Catholic leftover from someplace else and who knows where. But God knows he is there. Because I got greater comprehension of the love of God than that. And to simply say, oh, let's make the people feel good. And give them something to believe in. A lot. Eighty percent 
probability. That's what we preach. 80%. 2016, 50%. I told everyone during 2016, Jesus is not going to rapture. Jesus is not coming back. Starting January 1st, 2017, you are going to hear us always say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Get ready. We used to sing those songs at evangelism things, you know, Drake Lori used to use them a lot. I don't know if he still does. Maybe he does. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. You know, that's a nice thought. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's a kumbaya moment. Yeah, we're here. We are gathered together as a family. You know, and I like the idea. My family's not so close, but, you know, my family is saved. We don't all go to the same church. You know, we don't all have the same walk. My wife and I have two separate walks. Hers is different than mine, but, you know, I watch to make sure she's doing okay, you know, and ask her questions to see if she's in the faith and along the way, the right way. And she is. You know, she doesn't sit down and watch. I mean, she has listened to me at times. She can't get around it right now. She's in the other room, you know, sleeping, you know, while I'm recording this, you know, for the New Year's Eve service because we're running out of time. But she hears all this, and there are things that she is changed by them. God taking them and applying them to her life. And she applies it as the Lord leads. If she were to follow me and I were to teach her and preach to her and become the right disciple, she would not be my wife. She would divorce me and then follow my teaching, which is fine, but I would not have had a wife. I would have had a follower of Jesus because I would have taught her to be herself and not marry to me. Now that she's married to me, as God has put her in my life to be my help me, she helps me in the ministry. She is a comfort and a soul. She is a strength I need at times to be alongside me, not behind me, and not equal, but we both seek the Lord, seek the lead. So God is in control of our marriage, as God is in control of my life, and as God needs to be in control of the world, you are going to see things fall apart that at first are going to be built up. In other words, 2017 through 20, whatever, 34, there will also come a time, besides the degrees of separation, a time of, you ever been fishing? Hooked it. Oh, let it out. Let that fish run. And that fish got hooked and runs like a son of a gun, right? And then you kind of go, put a little tension on it. Draw it back in. Let it out. Draw back it. I don't fish. I'm making this up. I'm guessing. No, I don't really fish. My wife fishes. I don't fish. i got to learn how. You know, and you draw it in, draw it out. I could throw a net out, but I probably could never pull a fish. But I know you throw it out there, you cast it out there, you, know, you hook them and you know, let it loose and pull it. And the tension, you keep wearing that fish out until he's, he's slowly being brought back in. Hook, line, and sinker. Hook. Which way are you going? Are you being worn out and the world is reeling you in? Or are you being worn out and you're turning yourself in to God? You see, I question whether or not you're saved. I don't tell you an assurance of salvation. You want assurance of salvation? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, old things are passed away, behold, all things become new. If. Here's your assurance. If. That's the only one Jesus will give you. If anyone comes to me, I will know where it's cast out. If. There's a big if in the Bible. And in every place where it talks about salvation, it says if. And then it says what it says. So you want an assurance of your, you are saved? If. You want an assurance of I'm saved? If. I know the scripture says today, if I hear his voice, harden not my heart, it's a sense of provocation. So, Today, right now, I'm saved. When I wake up tomorrow, I go through my normal routine, and if I am doing what God wants me to, and I am living in accordance to His will, and I am practicing all the things He's taught me and has prepared me, and I know that I should be in His will at that time, I am saved. I will tell you that. I'm saved. But I'm not going to tell you tomorrow I'm saved. I'm not going to tell you next year I'm saved. I'm not going to tell you next whatever it is I'm saved. Any more than I'm going to tell you you're saved. Because someone does that, they play God, and they do not have that authority. But they have that accountability. You see, I have an accountability to tell you the truth. 
And the truth is, you determine your own salvation. Every day you have that opportunity to be either damned or blessed. Every day you have that opportunity to walk with God or walk away from God. Every day is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Today, if you hear his voice. So, really, I'm not trying to make you saved and rededicate your life every day. I'm telling you that you should be in a relationship that every day you know if you're saved. You have that assurance because you are in Christ. You are in Jesus. You are talking, walking, experiencing, and knowing him in a personal and intimate way. If you aren't doing it every day, you are not saved. You are going for a church fix that lately, guess what? Maybe the Spirit of God left the temple, and it wasn't there when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And yet they thought it was. They pretended it was. They claimed it was. But Antiochus Epiphanes, hundreds of years before that, a pig was slaughtered in there. And then they dedicated it by claiming there was a miracle of oil. Was there a miracle? According to Jewish history, it's a lie. And so, were they really dedicating the temple? The Feast of Dedication wasn't used as lighting candles or a candelabra. They were using water, and Jesus identified with that. They were using the menorah to light the menorah, and Jesus identified with that. So the reality I have to ask you is, in prophecy and probability, are you looking for the rapture? Or are you looking for the realization of the knowledge that Today, Jesus has been speaking to me anyways, so what difference does it make what day it is? I know that if today he said, follow me, I could walk outside the door and he would lead me out to the place where he's going to take me up into the air. And maybe I'll ascend up on my own Mount of Transfiguration. Or I'll ascend on the Mount of Ascension. I'll be transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration and ascend on the Mount of Ascension. Because I got news for you, the rapture may not be like in your mind, like that. For everyone around you, they may go, where do you go? And you may have walked out the door and they never saw you walk out. You may walk down the street and they never saw you go down the street. You may get off the airplane and you may never saw you get off the airplane. And you went to a place where Jesus every day had been talking to you anyway, then you met with him and he took you up. And when did that happen? In the twinkling of an eye. Now on earth, yeah, but it took some time. In your time frame, it happened instantaneously. Just what? Or on their time frame, instantaneously in your time frame, you had all these things happening. You walked here, you went there, and God took you there. Happened to Peter in the book of Acts. You want to know what the end of the world is like? You're listening to it. God will blow your mind. He won't give you what you expect. He will give you what he has said. And what he has said is direct, it is blunt, and it is true. And if it doesn't say disappear, don't look there. Don't go there and don't assume that it's automatic. If Jesus said take up your cross and follow me, you take up a cross and you follow him. Some people take that literal, and God's not going to hold it against them. But there is a cross to bear, and only you know where it is, and only you know what it is. So if you're walking with God, you know what you need to do. 